Mr. Schultz, thank you very much for having me here this morning. Um, we had a wonderful conversation. You were one of the first guys I ever interviewed for the NAM archives, and we talked extensively about Fender, but we didn't talk a whole lot about your earlier career, and I would love to just ask you a couple <coughs> of questions about that. Sure. First of all, to sort of put the whole thing in perspective, where did you grow up? In a little town outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, called McKeesport. I just talked to Mr. Uh, Garbett from right. the same place. I didn't know that. He was from the same place. <laughs> How did you uh, first um, get associated with, with music? Did, was there music in your home when you were growing up? Yes, there was always music in, uh, at home. And throughout uh, high school, I played sports and music. After high school, I got hurt at college playing football, so I, I went into music full time. And that's how I got into it. Hmm. What was your first instrument? I played tenor sax and clarinet. Oh, is that right? You're right. Oh, boy, that's great. And did you do that professionally? Yes, around local, a local professional, around Pittsburgh and western Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. And w when did it sort of occur, occur to you that you could actually make a living in the music industry? Well, I got into the music repair business. I was a band instrument repairman and had my own shop with a local dealer and from there on I just moved into wholesale and from uh, I ran a big shop in Chicago Lion and Healy and I went from there into wholesale uh, wholesale school music and from there to Fred Gretsch from Fred Gretsch to Yamaha for 13 years. Wow. It's amazing to me you have really two huge careers in the industry and some people in the band instrument never would have imagined you in the guitar business no. and vice versa. You're right. <laughs> As a band instrument repairman uh, for Lion and Healy, can you give me a little bit, Lion and Healy doesn't exist anymore, but for the longest time they were really big. They were one of, <clears throat> one of the powerhouses in Chicago. They had 13 stores. Mm. Uh, they called on schools. Uh, I was in charge of all service plus their, uh, at a later date, their educational program. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Now, did they also make their own instruments? No. Oh, they didn't? It was no, they bought from the major manufacturers. Oh, I see. Okay. They made harps. They were a harp company. I gotcha. Okay, interesting. Did you like uh, the band repair business? Yeah, it was good, but you, know, you only have two hands, and you can only do so much in 10, 12 hours a day. <laughs> so uh, it got to be a lot of pressure. At that time, there were not a lot of instrument repair people. Mm. So you were always two, three weeks behind. <laughs> and there's always a student who needs help. Oh my, home. yes. <laughs> Did you have um, tricks of the trade when you would um, solicit business, or was this part of the function of the company and you would just... Um, repair the instrument? The company, the people brought them in. You didn't need any tricks. Mm. Uh, at that time, there was such a scarcity. They brought them in. They begged to be first on the list. And, you know, you tried to help them as fast as you could. Mm. And the band directors uh, in the schools were the same. You developed quite a rapport with them, and you were always helping them for the Friday night football game or the concert or something like that. It's also interesting that Chicago really was a hotbed. Yes, it was. And in fact, it made sense that the NAM show was there for many years during that time. Yes, yeah, Chicago, Indiana, Michigan. Mm. That corner there was very, very strong. Oh, yeah, of course, you had Elkhart, Indiana, yeah. far away. Yeah. Interesting. So what, what made you um, decide to go over to Gretsch? Well, an opening came up in their sales and marketing for Queen Own band instruments. So I took it, and then gradually grew into the guitar drum uh, part of the business, and uh, that was it. The retail was tough. Uh, the owner didn't want to put any money into it. He was very happy with what we were doing, and he just wanted to let it remain the same. Mm. So uh, I moved over there for wholesale experience. Interesting. Did you ever work with m Mr. Gretsch, Fred? <coughs> it depends which. Mr. Gretsch, or uh, oh, senior? <laughs> no, uh, no. There was a uh, Fred Jr. Oh, okay. was uh, the gentleman in charge when I was there. I see. He and a guy by the name of Duke Kramer. Oh yeah. What kind of 
kind of guy was Duke? I hear his name brought up a lot. He was a tough manager. He was a good manager. I learned a lot from him. Hmm. It was no fool around guy. It, when you worked, you worked, and when you played, you played. You know, and uh, but he was uh, he he knew the business well. Hmm. Where is the period of time in which you worked um, with Mr. Garbutt? At Gretsch for a short time, and then at Yamaha for uh, about 13 years. Interesting. How, it's interesting to me, too, because that era uh, with, with Gretsch, I'm assuming is the first exposure you had to the intimacy of combo instruments. Right. Right. That was, that was my first, first uh, exposure to it. And it came uh, during a, a very high period of time uh, when things were very good, and then all of a sudden it dropped off. Mm. Was that associated with the Beatles? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that rock era, that time. Mm. What was the decline based on? Just business quit. Music trends out in the, uh, in the marketplace changed. Mm. And so things just stopped. Like somebody turned the switch, uh, the light off. <laughs> And did you um, then take up a job at Yamaha? Yeah, then I went with Yamaha. I was a district uh, sales manager for four years. Then I became sales manager, then uh, vice president and president of the Grand Rapids uh, organization, where we combined manufacturing, distribution, and sales. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. What sort of organization was it when you first got over there? It was very light. Very weak. We didn't have a lot of people. We were bringing new lines in. The band instrument line was new. The acoustic guitars were new. The combo products were almost non-existing, but we had some. We were bringing that in, and uh, we had very few people. I think we had eight salesmen, something like that. That's all. Hmm. And uh, but we grew from there. Yeah, as I understand it, that huge explosion of Yamaha occurred when you were there. Right. What was that like? It was big, and uh, we got a real education, and the Japanese were excellent to work with, hmm. and uh, it was a controlled explosion. It just didn't take off and everybody run, you know, selling. We just uh, we did so much a year, and uh, we penetrated the market very well, and uh, we had a, an excellent reputation. Hmm. That's true. Do you think that they had, well, did you feel that they had a reputation to overcome in terms of doing business with Americans, a Japanese company shortly after World War II, or did you not Th see There that? was some of that. In, in certain areas like uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, where the I think the 22nd Division was annihilated uh, the first part of the war, but not a lot. It uh, Basically, it was selling the product, uh, convincing people there was quality there. And Yamaha did it because they had more people in R&D, I think, than the rest of the industry altogether. Yeah, that's what I understand. Yeah, the Huge R&D facilities. Sometimes we had heard, especially in those early days, that, you know, cheap products coming out of Japan. That really never applied to Yamaha, did it? No. There was always quality. We, we may have underpriced to get market share, but it was always quality product. What was the, the challenges that you saw they had in terms of um, expanding to other instruments? Was it a matter of advertisement or was it a matter of just exposure? Exposure, brand acceptance. Uh, you know, we got pretty good acceptance with the band instruments. Uh, we were on the level with Selmer, Khan, King. Uh, <coughs> acoustic guitars, we took big market share in acoustic guitars because no one had a facility that could manufacture in quantity and in mix like Yamaha had. The biggest challenge is when we hit electronic instruments. But we had one thing uh, going for us was electronic keyboards because Yamaha was big in the home organ business and there was a lot of technology that uh, we used from there. Hmm, that's very interesting. It must have been a fun experience. It was. It was, it was a lot of fun. And your name and your reputation grew during this time because now you've been on sort of the seat in a major explosion of this <laughs> company. Um, 
What were your thoughts about your career at that point? Well, I went up to Grand Rapids to head up the consolidation of manufacturing, sales, marketing, and then one of our, uh, in Japan, there was a big shakeup with the president of the company in Japan who was a personal friend of mine, and there comes a time when it's time to move from a Japanese company. And you can't describe what it is, but you know what it is when it's there. And at that time, Mr. McLaren left and went to CBS. He called me to come in and take Fender over, and I still had my home in California, uh, so my wife and I decided that would be best. Hmm. That was interesting. Yeah. What was the, you probably can speak of this more than anybody on the planet, there is this um, thought about pre-CBS Fenders um, as sort of a, a, a knock to the quality. Did, what, what, what are your <coughs> thoughts about that? During the very early stages, yes. The pre-CBS was better because CBS allowed the company to deteriorate, mm -hmm. allowed the products, the quality. Uh, but when I took over, they gave me millions of dollars to put back into R&D, to put into equipment, and we brought the quality level back up. And today, uh, there's nothing like a pre-CBS guitar. The quality is consistent. It's probably the best guitars that are being made because we made big investments. Huge R&D, huge equipment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the, yes, at one time there was a pre-CBS versus what we were doing when I first got there. And that's interesting. Because I do know that, as you said, uh, CBS really did care about the quality, and they also introduced expansion in terms of product line. Yeah, right? yeah. And did you oversee all of that? Yeah. What was that like? That was a nightmare in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> How so? We did a whole new catalog, oh. and w which meant we built our R&D up to about 60, 65 people. I uh, had to buy new equipment, uh, but we got we had a whole new catalog put together when they decided to sell us. Mm. And what was that like? It was a nightmare for a while, because they put us up for sale, they paraded everybody by the numbers, uh, everybody knew what we were doing. And uh, the books didn't show that this was a, a good venture for anybody until uh, finally they asked me to put a group together and see what I could do with the company. So I put a group together and raised the money and bought the company. Oh, so they approached you to get yeah. that idea? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're, they're uh, uh, chief financial officer. Is that right? Did, did you immediately think, oh yeah, I could definitely raise the money or were you a little skeptical? <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. I said, yeah, I'll do it. And from there on, uh, my CFO and I just went to work and raised the money. Unbelievable. Good move, huh? Very good. <laughs> it's been a rewarding 22, 23 years. Wow, unbelievable. Yeah. And now, as you said, 20-something years with Fender, um, now you're sort of the guitar guru. Well, I don't know if I'm a guru or not, <laughs> but, you know, Fender has a great name, a great founder. Uh, all we had to do was you know, follow his, uh, uh, his philosophy. Mm. And, you know, we work under the premise that uh, uh, you've got to look ahead and make changes, but you can never forget your past. And our past was Leo Fender, and uh, a, quite an innovator, uh, philosopher, and, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun to follow somebody like that. Yeah, I bet. Probably challenging at points, too. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, yeah. we... You have to do the same but different. The same but different. You've got to look ahead, but you've got to keep innovating and creating and developing. I have sort of a challenging question um, for you, and that is, what is your response to people who sort of criticize the idea that Fender has offshore manufacturing? What is your response to that? Well, show me a product that doesn't have offshore parts in it. Uh, show me a product that's total American made. Show me any musical instrument that is total American made today. And uh, <clears throat> if we want to start kids, then we better be able to obtain the price points. And uh, you can't do that by manufacturing uh, completely in the United States. A lot of thought went into that, didn't it? 
Yes, it did. When we first started, all we had was eight, nine hundred dollar guitars over in Fullerton, and we, we missed the whole youth market. So I went offshore at that time and brought three, four hundred dollar guitars in, and uh, we cover the market pretty well right now. And the quality really wasn't uh, justified, was it? Or, I mean, uh, altered? No, we had, well, we sent our own engineers. Mm -hmm. We had our own people in the, in the factories for a month at a time. We trained half of the offshore manufacturers that exist today. Mm -hmm. And that comes back and bites us sometime. Yeah, I bet. Just another perspective on, on uh, the industry, in your opinion. Um, do you remember your first NAMM show? Yes. I'd like to have pictures of it, and I can't find them. Really? We, uh, <clears throat> the first NAMM show, on opening day, I was in my office waiting for the final OK for the deal to go through with CBS. Huh. And the show opened at 9 o'clock. At 7.15, I got a call from New York. The deal had been completed. Uh, all we had was tables draped with uh, tablecloths and a very, very down uh, side display and some instruments that uh, we had ordered for the future. And so it was, it was really, it, it was the most downplayed display I'd ever seen. <laughs> and everybody standing around wondering, is Fender going to make it? Will they be here? The whole thing. We went in. We had a great show. Our dealers backed us like it, it was hard to believe, and fortunately, we got our products from that show in two weeks later and were able to deliver, and uh, it made us look pretty good. <laughs> it's one of these, huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. How have you seen um, your use of the trade show increase over the years? It has grown. Uh, unfortunately, they're too expensive, but that's part of life. And uh, we, uh, we've had the last four or five years big trade shows, mm. uh, both in Nashville and both in, uh, uh, in California. And uh, we see all our dealers, you know, it's the same old thing, but we do a lot of writing. Mm. And when I hear these people are upset they didn't write, I can't understand why. However, we focus, we have 60 people in R&D, and we have a continuous flow of new product coming in, hmm. into the marketplace. Then, yeah, that's a very good point. You were also privy to, you know, the early days of NAM when, as we now say, that NAM was just a trade show, and now NAM has expanded to education and so on. How have you seen that change? Oh, it's been a big change. I think they've done a lot. They've done a lot for the dealers. I don't think the dealers utilize it as, as much as they uh, should. Uh, it, it's been, I, I think for the dealers who got behind NAM and worked with them and pushed it, I think it's been a, a very rewarding uh, program for them. Um, just two more pointed questions for you. One, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on uh, individuals, maybe let's call them mentors, people who along the way have helped you or gave you advice or, or uh, assisted you in some way in your own career in the industry. Does anybody come to mind when I ask that? Well, Duke Kramer from Gretsch. Many of the Japanese from Yamaha mm -hmm. were, were very, very uh, instrumental in teaching me to be patient, long-term planning, detail it, you know, refine it. And then my friend Ed Garbett, uh, uh, was a big help. Uh, I would say that's where I got my foundation hmm. from, and that's uh, that's where I learned the business. Yeah, interesting. You also have the perspective of the bands and the guitars, so this might be an interesting question also. Um, I love to ask your feelings about the, the greatest innovation in the music products industry during your career. When I asked this of Henry Steinway, he said the Hammond organ, which I thought was sort of an interesting answer. What is your response to that? Anything come to mind? Yeah, un unfortunately, the, uh, the, the, uh, the piano in the electronic form, mm. uh, it came out as a synthesizer, and then they've developed you know, technology today, and I think that's, that's probably one of the biggest innovations in the, 
uh, in the industry right now. And why do you say unfortunately? Well, it, it took away from one part of the market. Mm -hmm. it, it took away from the home piano, it took away from, uh, well, from us, it was, we had the uh, uh, Rhodes piano, but the synthesizer through the evolution to where uh, they're at today with keyboards, mm -hmm. I, I think is, is very substantial. You know, you can get a keyboard at any price. A child can, uh, for four or five hundred dollars, go out and get a small keyboard and learn to play. And I think that has been the one of the leading factors. Very good point. Yeah. Because there's guitars all over the place, and trumpets, and drums, and you know, that kind of. Now, in the other areas of sound reinforcement, and places like that, you know, DJ mu uh, music and equipment, that's a whole different, uh, whole different era. Mm. Um, I have a few seconds left and I just wanted to thank you on camera. You were one of the visionaries in being a charter benefactor of the Museum of Making Music. Right. And you also loaned us some of your own guitars in those early days. And so on camera, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Well, for you're that. quite welcome. We're glad to participate. Had you been out there early on in the, in the uh, development of that uh, museum? I don't know, don't remember when I first saw it. I know Gil Marshner called me for some equipment and mm. we scraped up some things okay. and we sort of went about it like that. Yeah, well, you know, it's my favorite job in the whole world, so I have you personally to think <laughs> <laughs> And uh, now you have a Fender Museum. Yes. Tell us about that. It's more of a learning organization than museum, although we do show things. We have 450 students that get free lessons a week uh, the city and the county build a beautiful building for us. Uh, we'll be able to have up to a thousand students in there. We give lessons on keyboards, drums, violins, band instruments, and guitars. And uh, it, it's quite rewarding. We now have a, <coughs> a, uh, a stage, an outdoor theater where uh, we can do performances. And this is run by the city. Uh, of Corona and the uh, the people over there in the county. Mm -hmm. And we lend it our name and back it and do what we can do. That's great. Yeah, we went over there recently. It's an amazing facility. Yeah. A great teaching opportunity. Yeah. And I understand the waiting list is quite long. Yes. <laughs> it's about 600 right now. Wow, wow. What a, what a great opportunity. Um, my final question is sort of a silly one, but um, I'd like to ask it anyway, and that is being the head of Fender for so long, and of course Fender being so associated with performers, um, is there any performers that, that you met that were either, you know, some of you, oh, wow, this is really great, or do you sort of get numb to that after a while? No, you meet some of the top players, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, they're real classy people, and uh, they're talented, uh, they're loyal to you, they're nice to be around. Uh, in fact, most of the younger players, I let up to the younger marketing people mm -hmm. because they relate to them a lot better than I do. But uh, there's a, we have a lot of nice young p players and people come through here yeah. who are, are artists and are endorsers. Mm -hmm. So what do you see the future for you? Are you can stick around here for a while? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it all depends on my health, mental and physical. <laughs> That's if they don't drive you crazy, you'll stay around. Huh? Yeah, as long as I'm healthy. <laughs> I really appreciate the time. I know.